I don't know about you, but in a good bit of my formative years, my imagination was positively filled with images of treasure. From repeat watchings of the Goonies, tales of pirates, booty, the salvaging of the Atocha, the Hobbit's tale of smog and his loot-filled lair, hours. Hours playing Dungeons and Dragons and Final Fantasy, centered on getting rich, powering up, and taking on evil, so much of my imagination scape was filled with gold and silver coins, glittering jewels of all colors and magical items, many of which were protected by frightful guardians, booby traps, and terrible curses. When people ask me, how did you get into studying esotericism? A big part of that answer is just how much of my early life was filled with the awe of magic and treasure. Even now, I collect medieval coins and just holding a few silver coins in my hands, now hundreds of years old, still fills me with a sense of awe. It allows me to tap into that childhood sense of treasure magic. The intersection of treasure and magic has a long, complex, and fascinating history, and I hope you'll join me as we explore the lore of treasure magic, how magic was used to discover long-hidden loot, the terrible guardians of treasure, and how treasure itself magically sought to elude discovery. We're even going to take a close look at a few actual medieval spells for finding treasure. If you're interested in magic, hermetic philosophy, alchemy, Kabbalah, or the history of the occult, make sure to subscribe. Check out my other content on topics in esotericism, including playlists on all those topics I just mentioned. Also, if you want to support my work of providing accessible, scholarly, and free content on topics in esotericism for free here on YouTube, I hope you consider supporting my work on Patreon, or by taking a look at maybe a one-time donation to the project. You can find those links below, and I really appreciate your consideration of supporting the channel and the project of making Esoterica widely available. Also, if you use any of the knowledge or spells from this channel and you find treasure, I'm gonna need you to, uh, I'm gonna need you to hit me up. I ain't kidding. Let's explore treasure magic and the magic of treasure. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. Unlike other forms of magic, for instance, erotic binding magic, wrongly called love magic, curses like the Led de Ficciones of the Roman period, attempts to question the dead, good old-fashioned necromancy, or bind and control supernatural beings, the topic of Salomonic magic, treasure magic is a relative newcomer to the magical practices of the ancient Levant and medieval Europe. In fact, there are virtually no traces of treasure magic to be found in the vast collections of the Greek magical papyri or late classical texts such as the Sefer Hirazim. Prosperity magic, sure, everybody wants to get rich, there's all kinds of prosperity magic, but virtually nothing for specifically discovering hidden or otherwise lost riches. Of course, we're fairly confident that such magic very likely existed in the ancient world, it was well known, for instance, that Egyptian tombs were magically sealed and contained, well, vast wealth and treasure. And with the exception of Tut Ach Aten, later known as Tut Ach Amun's tomb, discovered by Howard Carter, almost every other major tomb was totally looted by the pre-modern period. I mean, many entrances to Egyptian tombs now are actually former tomb raiding tunnels. 
Surely these ancient raiders were keenly aware of the numinous power of such crypts, and they could use some form of magical tools to both detect the treasure therein and to protect themselves in their midnight expeditions. Also, if they got caught, they typically got impaled, so there's that. Though such magic, insofar as it existed, has basically passed into the obscurity of history. Indeed, it isn't really until the late Middle Ages and early modern period, indeed this is kind of the high watermark of magical treasure hunting, that we begin to see a sustained literature on the magical detection of treasure and protection for the treasure hunters. But why then? Well, a few reasons spring most immediately to mind. Literacy rates in this period were simply rising, and it's just a case that we see a substantial increase in magical literature of all kinds, treasure magic included. Further, tales of actual treasure discovery were beginning to circulate quite widely, especially in print. Of course, real treasure was to be found in late medieval and early modern Europe. For instance, that old Roman border, especially with Germania, much more populated by the medieval period, had once hosted tens of thousands of soldiers, Roman soldiers, whose pay would have been buried or otherwise hidden. If that soldier never came back, say, I don't know, they had a run-in in the Teutoburg forest, there it lay until an accidental plow unearthed it. Such hordes are still found nearly weekly in Europe. Further, pre- and post-Roman pagans often buried their high-caste, high-status individuals in elaborate tumuli or conspicuous barrows. It's like flatland and a big artificial hill, which you could simply dig a trench into and strike gold and silver interred therein. The Protestant Reformation also saw the closure and the looting of the monasteries, and of course monks would secrete uh, away valuables, many gold and silver religious objects like candelabra and things, and many such buildings were positively honeycombed with crypts and underground vaults. You're, you're already seeing the, the Dungeons and Dragons stuff beginning to build in this episode. It's only going to get more. This period also saw the rise in interest in ancient Rome and the first clumsy attempts at uh, excavating Roman sites, culminating with the discovery of Herculaneum and Pompeii in the early 18th century. Dozens of years also of contemporaneous warfare in the early modern period also meant hiding valuables before the arrival of pillaging armies. So secret caches are still being discovered to this day. In fact, even up to the Second World War, these secret passages were still being walled up and things were still being found from that period. I even grew up in the American South with legends of Confederate gold that was somewhere hidden in the bowels of my hometown. Last, this period also saw the rise of complex centralized government bureaucracies which made and prosecuted laws about treasure. So we just have more literature about treasure hunting because there were just clear governments who had an interest in getting the loot themselves. Of course, the crown, the landowners, and the treasure finders all wanted a cut when treasure was discovered, and European law did and does vary widely on this issue. Some legal codes saw all treasure as the property of the state, others divvying it up between the concerned parties with the state taking a cut. Sometimes it's got divvied up in three separate ways. And further at this time, almost all treasure hunting, and by extension, all treasure discovery, was linked with magic. And, of course, this is the period of the witch hunts, the state took a keen interest in those associating with any form of magic. Simply put, treasure in a variety of forms was actively and continuously discovered through the late Middle Ages and through the modern period and beyond, it's still being discovered. In fact, metal detectorists are still finding substantial hoards from this period. The largest hoard of Anglo-Saxon gold and silver, the Staffordshire hoard, was discovered only in 2009, valued at 3.285 million pounds. Another hoard of 5,000, over 5,000 Anglo-Saxon silver coins was discovered in 2014. There were 425 gold coins discovered in Israel in 2020, and so on. You can check the news on Google News and find dozens of these hoards. 
simply put, there was and is treasure to be found, but how? Well, before systematic box grid excavations and metal detectors, there was treasure sorcery. But in the medieval imagination, there was a small problem. The treasure itself had magical defenses. Thus, treasure hunts were something of a medieval magical duel between the guile of the sorcerer and the wile of the treasure itself. As you probably know, very early in European lore, treasure was associated with magic. Pre-Christian sagas saw hordes protected by dragons, such as in the Saga of the Volsungs and the Elder Edda. The so-called Rheingold is still the subject of modern treasure hunts in Germany, some of which still employ quasi-magical practices. Of course, similar motifs also appear in Beowulf, where treasures lay in the murky layer of Grendel's mom? Monster mom? Hiding treasure underwater seems to have been a kind of general Germanic motif. And, of course, in the lair of the dragon, the last act of that epic. Remember, Wiglaf and Beowulf go kill a dragon and get a bunch of gold. Beowulf dies. Sorry. Spoilers. Both of these treasure elements were made famous by the operas of Wagner and then by the modern epics of Tolkien. Those, of course, have gone on to form the foundation of Dungeons and & Dragons and the hundreds, thousands of role-playing games to come in its wake. Now, while dragons and layers would be reduced to snakes and pits by the medieval period, the core notion here is that treasure itself had magical associations and was always very nearly tinged with some element, perhaps a very high degree of danger. First and foremost, treasure was thought to actually be somewhat sentient, semi-sentient, and had a desire to avoid being detected. One of the more amazing feats of treasure was its ability to shapeshift, apparently. To avoid detection, treasure could just transform itself into rubbish, only being transformed back into treasure by using magic or, you guessed it, alchemy. Paracelsus notes that alchemical fire would undo the shape-shifting effects of treasure, rendering the seeming rubbish back into treasure. Further, treasure could detect being sought out and actually could move itself around, burrowing deep into the earth to avoid being captured. It could kind of run away from you. In fact, treasure would often be used to lure further treasure. Given this ability, it was thought imperative that all treasure hunting, like stalking a deer in a forest, was to be done in complete silence. Thus, treasure hunts, curiously enough, were often completely silent affairs. Further, in keeping with the pre-modern conception of magical sympathy that like attracts like, it was a common feature of treasure hunting to use some small amount of gold and silver, typically in coin form, to actually bait a treasure, kind of like going fishing. Here one would bury a small amount in the earth near this suspected treasure, then dig around that area, thus stopping the treasure from being able to escape. Of course, bags of silver and gold coins for treasure bait would often just disappear not long after being deposited in the hands of the would-be treasure fisher. Also, treasure was thought the easiest to detect at certain times of the year or in specific astrological conditions. Typically, liminal periods were thought best for treasure hunts, especially the period from Christmas to Epiphany, overnight between Sunday and Monday, the conjunctions of Jupiter and Saturn, or even in between places such as crossroads, were generally thought to be magical, if not also mildly demonic. That whole X marks the spot business probably has its origins in just such a concept known in the Middle Ages as cross digging. Further, treasure was invariably thought to have a host of hostile guardians. There was a general conception that about a meter into the earth was kind of the domain of various spirits, fairies, demons, and other kinds of supernatural creatures. Further, many treasure hunts also took place in ruins, basements, crypts, and caves, and these are also places thought to be inhabited by very similar kinds of dangerous supernatural creatures. 
Wealth in general for medieval Christians was always morally ambiguous to say the least, and treasure was often associated with mammon, the demon of greed. Thus, such beings had to be appeased, bound, and banished if they couldn't be avoided during the treasure hunt. You don't want a kobold or orok bothering your treasure hunting. As you might imagine, interacting with such beings was almost always the purview of magic and often the frightful arts of necromancy. Thus, the discovery of magic was almost always wrapped up with some tinge of black magic. I mean, how else could you wrestle it from such a wide range of supernatural treasure guardians? In fact, many treasure narratives simply end with the hunters being frightened away by demonic illusions. Paracelsus, ever the maverick if there ever was one, actually says that the party, the treasure hunting party, should laugh and joke during the hunt, going against all the received wisdom of that age, precisely in order to endure the terrible illusion magic of the treasure demons. If you're having fun, you don't mind the treasure demon magic. Treasure Guardians easily could have its own episode. The folklore is just that rich. Though, ghosts are by far the most common treasure guardian in the literature. Inevitably, in life, they secreted away their treasures and, well, perished before it could be spent according to their wishes. Sometimes these ghosts rave in greed madness to protect their hoard, their gold lust keeping them from entering the afterlife, though in other narratives they wish for their treasure to actually be found and to be righteously dispersed. In these accounts, the treasure hunter could actually frame their vocation, treasure hunting, in religious terms. They're actually setting free trapped souls, giving some of the treasure to charity and some to the church, thus distancing themselves from that whole taint of necromancy. In fact, Paracelsus seems to actually have held that that hidden treasure alone, alone, was the cause of all hauntings. Thus, the presence of any ghost actually indicated treasure. Despite the elusive nature of treasure, it did have a singular giveaway to its presence, a mysterious and otherworldly flame emitted by the treasure. This legend probably has its origins in connection with the supernatural power of saintly relics, Though a pre-Christian origin is just as possible, we see something like this in the early sagas. These relics were thought to emit perfume, light, and flames. And treasure also was thought to emit a very faint flame that burned, but did not consume. Burning bush style. One could even tell the nature and burial depth of the treasure based on these flames, which were typically bluish in color, but could vary depending on the type of treasure. In fact, you may recognize this exact motif from the opening pages of Bram Stoker's Dracula. Remember that blue flame haunting the very gates of Count Castlevania? Castle Dracula? Castlevania? Though such ghost lights are absolutely ubiquitous in the folklore. Of course, all of this stands up against the treasure hunters themselves. In medieval and early modern narratives, the treasure hunting band is surprisingly uniform. Rarely was treasure hunting done alone because of the specialized roles required in the hunt itself, from legal legitimacy to magical powers, magical powers to just, you know, digging. Treasure hunting was almost always a team sport. So what did a typical treasure hunting party look like? And again, there's just no way to make this not sound like D&D. Sorry, not, not sorry. Typically the group could cut through social and even religious categories. Often the party was led by a local of some legal standing, a minor aristocrat perhaps, who might even be able to pull a treasure hunting permit of sorts, something that was keenly needed for the legitimacy of the treasure hunt and to avoid charges of stealing from the crown or the fisc. Just in case the treasure was found, which it almost never was, or they just needed to avoid being condemned as a band of treasure necromancers. Hashtag band of treasure necromancers. Secondly, there was inevitably a ritual expert or treasure sorcerer, or at least someone experienced with magical practice and the detection of treasure. This ranged enormously in terms of their magical powers. Often this person was a kind of 
charming stranger. For whatever reasons, Venetians, folks from Venice, were thought to be the best of all treasure sorcerers. Or, in a lot of cases, it was just kind of wandering vagrants who would fall into this role with various magical books or just any kind of book with weird stuff in it. It wasn't uncommon for those in religious orders to also take on this role. Again, let's not forget that whole clerical necromantic underground business that makes a lot of time on this channel. And who else to, well, better exercise a treasure demon than a local monk or priest. The third group were the support staff for the hunt, which included laborers, cooks, and even engineers. Also, some of those folks were willing to invest money to get the treasure hunt off the ground. This wasn't exactly cheap. And a final group could basically include gawkers, just curious spectators, to leering mockers. There were people who just followed treasure hunters around to make fun of them. Why have such a crowd following you around like that? Again, witnesses help to secure your right to the treasure if found, and can also help you resist charges of any unchristian magic stuff in the process of the search. Though, at the core of the treasure search was always the treasure sorcerer. As I mentioned a moment ago, the treasure sorcerer was the key member of the party because they located the treasure and protected the party from those demons and the fairies that wear boots that are the guardians of these treasures. Typically, they were non-local wanderers or even vagrants, and they even and they played up their eccentricity to sell their magical powers when they weren't frauds, and many, many were, or even occasionally virginal children would lead these hunts and even rare women. There's only a couple of cases of women leading treasure hunts. They were typically literate and had some general expertise in magic, and sometimes they were priests in lower orders or Protestant clergy, not being terribly uncommon in these treasure hunts. In fact, a young treasure hunter would actually go on to found a whole new religion in the 19th century. More on him in a minute. Interestingly, treasure hunting could even cross denominational lines in a time where those lines spelt life and death. I mean, this is the, the Hundred Years' War time period. Here we find Catholics and Protestants working in the same treasure hunts until tensions arose and, you know, treasure hunting and gold lust often ended up with people dead. Oh yeah, these treasure hunts were super dangerous. Uh, you had personal and religious tensions, cave-ins, structural collapses, all kinds of things, not to mention the, the demons and stuff, could lead to real injury and loss of life. Ironically, further death and injury only reinforced the idea of local treasure. If you get a bunch of people killed, there must be treasure there. Regardless, once you got your treasure sorcerer sorted out, they could begin deploying a wide range of magical practices to actually locate that treasure. The most common form of magic was also the closest to standard religion, prayer. Specifically, there was a set of prayers or incantation prayers to St. Christopher and St. Corona. I, I know, I know, whatever. For locating the buried treasure. While primarily known today as the patron saint of travelers, St. Christopher was then, in the early modern period, the medieval period, primarily known as a patron of treasure hunting. And dozens of volumes from that period betray the incantation-like prayers for summoning the saint employing his power to locate buried treasure, and then, interestingly enough, banishing him. Uh, this is a motif actually much more commonly found in demonic conjurations, again showing you that while we have a saint here, the structure is kind of necromantic. If you can't get a saint to help you, well, you might switch teams and go with demons. Various necromantic volumes that survived from the Middle Ages and the early modern period contain magic for summoning a host of different demons, some of which are specific for finding buried treasure. In the infamous Clavicula Solomonis, or the Key of Solomon, there are variously described spirits of Saturn and especially Jupiter, with the angel Sarachiel being especially useful for finding treasure. In other necromantic texts from the Middle Ages, we find a demon named Barbarus, Aziel, Chloron, sometimes known as Floron, who's also associated with a magical mirror. These are all helpful for finding treasure. 
Further, a host of magical sigils and symbols, which vary widely in terms of complexity and consistency, could also be used to detect the presence of treasure or protect those seeking it out from danger. Finally, there are numerous spells, or experimenta as they're called in the Middle Ages, found in the necromantic manuals of that time period for the detection of treasure. One such example, and there are many of these, one example taken from CLM 849, or the Munich Necromancer's Manual, details how to discover the location of a buried treasure via a spirit inside of a dream. This spell's relatively straightforward, but may betray some cross-cultural magic as well, interestingly enough. First, you have to confess your sins on a Sunday under a waxing moon when the sun is in Leo very early in the morning. Then you sprinkle yourself with some holy water, reciting a short missile formula along with Psalm 50 in the Vulgate while facing, of course, the crucifix. Afterward, one must intone a specific prayer actually beginning O Rabbi, my King and my God, Rabbi, Rabbi, Rex Meus et Deus Meus. That whole rabbi bid is interesting. Further supplications are made facing east, and then before bed, another prayer is made in which, well, in your dream, a spirit will come to you and help you locate the, well, what you wanted, the treasure. The next day, you can go locate the treasure that the spirit showed you in the dream. You can dig it up. And of course you have to give a set of alms and thanks to the newly found treasure that you have. And then of course you have to order three masses said in the honor of the Trinity, the dead, and one's own safe keeping. Honestly, virtually all medieval books of magic contain at least one spell for finding treasure, thus making treasure magic as common as spells for things like invisibility, erotic binding, or just generic cursing people. In fact, it would be a really fun collection just to collect all of the treasure related necromantic and magical spells and put that in one volume. Just treasure magic. It's a task for another day. In other words, treasure magic was part and parcel of the powers claimed by virtually all medieval sorcerers. In addition to magical summoning and binding, the treasure sorcerer had a wide range of magical tools at their disposal. So if you couldn't get a saint or a demon to help you, you just whipped out the magical technology. This is everything from candles made from human fat, which hissed near treasure, gross, to crystals and mirrors, which revealed the location of treasure via something like remote viewing or scrying. Though without a doubt, the most important and ubiquitous was the divining or the dowsing rod. Often cut by a virginal child, these wooden rods sometimes two rods and sometimes one rod shaped like a wishbone were thought to be drawn to treasure metallic veins or water or many other things for a host of reasons. In fact, metal rods were thought to obey the law of sympathy. Remember in the middle ages, like attracts like. And so again, this is much like the treasure bait mentioned earlier. The first systematic treatise on divining or dowsing was probably prepared by the quasi-legendary alchemist Basilius Valentinus, who claimed that metallic exhalations were detected by the rods in keeping with pretty classic standard alchemical theory, because how could I not mention alchemy a lot in this episode? I mean, it's about treasure, it all goes together. Since then, a dozen or more notions have been forwarded to explain how dowsing works. This is a practice which endears to this day. In fact, the history and use of divining or dowsing rods could easily occupy at least a whole episode. Finally, magical plants could also assist in treasure hunting. The most common magical plant here were fern seeds, which had the distinct problem of not exactly existing. So there's that, though both Bill Shakespeare and Ben Johnson both mentioned them and as having magical powers for finding treasure. Another treasure finding herb was the alleged radix effractoria, or the erupting root, sometimes linked in the English world with moonwort, which would cause the earth to burst asunder if placed near treasure. It was also alleged to make horseshoes pop off any poor horse that ran over them. And apparently you could also use it to break open a lock. You just put an herb in a lock and it bursts open. I mean, you don't have to do a strength check or anything. That's great. 
While treasure hunters were nearly always associated with magic, it was very rare for them to actually be accused of witchcraft and, generally speaking, received rather light punishments when caught. Even caught doing magic to find treasure. Why? It has to do with the specific crime of maleficia, the legal term for what we now use and what we now translate as witchcraft. Because the treasure sorcerer didn't make pacts with the devil or demons, typically, and certainly they weren't trying to undermine all of Christendom as the alleged witches were thought to do, these conjurers are more likely seen to be something as sacrilegious frauds by the authorities and let me tell you, fraud was the rule here. Virtually no cases of treasure magic working are known from judicial records, but dozens of cases of treasure magic related fraud are. In fact, as the early modern period gave way to the Enlightenment, as much as it did, treasure magic narratives greatly declined, typically giving way to tales of New World riches from, you guessed it, pirate's treasure, here often in quasi-magical maps, sometimes in codes. This is replacing those magic books and divination. There are, of course, secret treasures of the indigenous peoples of the Americas, such as the famed El Dorado, or things like lost mines containing massive veins of gold and silver, a la the lost Dutchman mine. By the 19th century, treasure seekers were much, much more likely to be tinged with a sense of fraud any much more than they were thought of as being, well, magical. Perhaps the most famous such 19th century American treasure sorcerer was a fellow known as Peepstone Joe, known for peering at stones in his hat to discover treasure in upstate New York. Well, when an angel led him to a golden book buried in a hill, Peepstone Joe began his career as the prophet Joseph Smith using those stones in a hat trick to translate the Book of Mormon. Of course, the early LDS movement is absolutely saturated with magic and Freemasonry and all manner of esotericism. So you bet your magic underwear that episode is forthcoming. Of course, quasi-magical treasure hunting continued well into the 20th and 21st centuries from the the goobers of the SS Ananerba, folks using divining rods in the Judean wilderness to find the treasures associated with the Copper Scroll. Yes, the Dead Sea Scrolls contains a Copper Scroll that has a bunch of treasure on it. To the Lagina Brothers out on Oak Island, which probably has about as much treasure on it as the History Channel features actual history. Though, good luck my fellow Michiganders. The single best volume on treasure magic is, without a doubt, Johannes Dillinger's Magical Treasure Hunting in Europe and North America. It's a pretty good book title. It's a really wonderful text and well worth picking up, aside from the, the treasure you're going to need to buy it. Sadly, while the Palgrave Historical Studies in Witchcraft and Magic are all wonderful volumes, if not a, a little specialized, they're really expensive. Not not brill expensive, but still prohibitively costly. Again, this is a pity because this puts otherwise amazing scholarships out of the hands of most people, especially most regular working class people. European magical treasure hunting has nearly a millennium long history, and I suspect that as long as hidden gold, silver, and jewels hold allure, people will use whatever means they can to discover it from the most advanced metal detectors to medieval necromancy. Good luck and Godspeed, my fellow Goonies. And again, you need to hit me up if you find the rich stuff. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and thanks for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.